Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. everybody. It's Kathy Guggenauer with a Dare to Leap podcast. Today, I have the great honor of interviewing Megan Purdy. Megan is the operations manager for Canadian Payroll Services, CPS, and she's the marketing manager for Kronos Consulting Group. At CPS, Megan de develops service offerings manages internal projects, and supports the business development team. At Kronos, she develops corporate communication brand strategies for the Kronos group of remote companies. That might give you a little hint on why she's here talking with me today, that word remote. <laughs> Megan has over a decade of experience in leading customer and account management teams in the HR tech and digital publishing space. Before joining the Kronos family, she was the managing editor of Workology, the founder and publisher of WWAC, and a freelance writer and editor. She has extensive experience in content marketing and social media management. Welcome, Megan. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Yeah. So with your extensive background, I just want to say you had to have started when you were three years old because you look like you're about 18, maybe 21 at the most. <laughs> I'm not going to say my age, but uh, I'm definitely older than you think. Well, anybody who's not watching the video version of this, if you're listening to the audio version, you're missing out because um, Megan is racking it today. She's She's styling today with um, makeup on and everything. I did not join her in that, but I will tell you, uh, if I had beautiful skin like yours, wow, I would be a very happy woman. <laughs> For the first time since March, I've been uh, completely remote since, uh, our whole team has been completely remote since mid-March. Did my makeup for the first time since then, and I had forgot a few things, but it's, uh, it was still fun. It's nice to get glammed up once in a while, maybe not every day. Well, you look really good, and I appreciate you being on here today. So, and of course, my dog's decided to start barking right now. I'm going to pause just for a second. <clears throat> my husband got up. That's why they're going crazy. It's a good reason. So. Or people. Uh, yeah, and he always gets up about this time of day, and dogs always go crazy. Okay, so let's just pause for a second. So, Megan. Tell me a little bit about the company that you work for and what you what you guys do at that company and anything that you want to share about remote working that goes on in your company. For sure. So um, I'm the marketing manager at the Kronos Consulting Group, um, and we are a 20-year-old recruiting firm that specializes um, in really highly skilled, hard-to-fill roles. Um, and I also do operations over at Canadian Payroll Services, which specializes in um, connecting really talented Canadian remote workers with global firms. So everyone we payroll is um, either remote, as in working from home, or they may be on site. So the vast majority of the people that we've worked for uh, in the last couple of decades um, are remote workers, uh, two different kinds, of course. You know, on site workers have one need, working from home uh, folks have different needs. Um, but that's the core of our business. And uh, as I said earlier, when I was talking about my makeup, we went fully remote ourselves. Um, we had already had like a flex policy in place as any sensible uh, company in 2020 does. Um, but uh, with the advent of the pandemic, we decided to go fully remote, uh, which we completed March 13th. And so we've all been working from home since and it's going really great. We're all really happy about it. That's excellent. Um, so I have a couple of questions about what you talked about. First, mm -hmm. you mentioned that your company already had a flex 
policy. Could you tell me what that looks like, a, a flex, the flex policy at your company? Uh, for sure. So um, flex work uh, generally means that um, your schedule is open to some kind of flexibility. And uh, within that, uh, it can mean a few different things. So it might mean that, um, let's say you're a new mom and you want to be working half days for a little while. Um, your your company would allow that, or perhaps uh, you want to be home with your kids more. So you might have three working days at home, two in the office, um, or it could be you know a temporary uh, work from home placement. So um, having a flex policy basically means that your company is open to a variety of working arrangements within the team. So uh, you're not necessarily a remote first company where everybody works from home and there's no central office, but uh, depending on the needs of your team, you are able to change working arrangements. <clears throat> I love that. I love the terminology that you're using, remote first, which means you always re- work at, work remotely. Is that what you're talking about yeah. there? Work remote first. And then the flex policy where depending on is it a combination of the individual needs and the needs of the company um, to work out that flex arrangement? For sure, it should be a negotiation between um, the employee and the company. Um, there may be some real need for the specific worker to be in the office at certain times. Like there could be, um, you know, meetings or certain collaborative activities, or it could even be that the company just has not yet um, moved all of its uh, functions off of like an in-office machine. Right. So not everything can be installed remotely. Sometimes uh, the license requires that they be in office for one function. So um, it needs to be a negotiation based on the needs of the employee, the needs of the team and just the reality of uh, the company setup. Right. Yeah. And you also mentioned that your company helps to fill hard to fill roles. Could you talk a little bit about what a hard to fill role is? Sure. So um, when we talk about hard to fill roles, we're talking about um, either extremely skilled uh, folks where um, there's only a few of them in the world who can can fill that role. So, for example, we used to work a lot in um, mining, engineering and um, the nuclear space. And there's only so many nuclear engineers, you know. Um, So knowing who those people are and being able to fill those roles is a great niche to be in. Um, When it comes to things like marketing and development, um, those roles are different, but there's still, uh, there are still uh, only a limited number of people who can fill um, growing roles, right? Like there's so many new roles in the tech space um, and digital marketing where people are just gaining expertise. Um, So part of our practice is to find people who can fill those roles. So rather than going for like bulk recruiting or, you know, okay, another front end developer, we want to focus on the hardest to fill roles. Wow. That I I did not know you meant really, really hard to fill roles like (laughs) nuclear. Yes. Okay. Got it. I I got it now. (laughs) So, and um, it's a very interesting that you mentioned digital marketing also, because I find, and I'm sure you have the same experience that with every new tech thing that happens um, and don't you love how, uh, technical I am when I say tech thing, <laughs> you know, I'm really good at this stuff, <laughs> but with every new thing that comes out, you immediately have needs and p- they want people to already know how to do it. And you can't do that overnight. Right. So you must have a good feel for who can learn those new technologies really quickly. Yeah. I mean, digital marketing is one of those fields that is transforming so rapidly and is constantly transforming. You know, it's not like we finished the Google transformation and now it's stable. No, like new things keep coming in every day. Um, And marketing as a whole is a vastly more technical discipline than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, um, Mm -hmm. like people have a vision of advertising and marketing um, as being still kind of the Mad Men era. And it's so much (laughs) more space than that, right? Um, you got to think of like programmatic advertising, um, learning, keeping up with all the changes in Google al- algorithms, stuff like that. It's an incredibly technical discipline these days. That's not to say it's not creative. Of course, it's still an incredibly creative discipline, but you have to somehow merge those two. And unfortunately, not everybody is able to keep up with that pace of change. Right. I totally agree with you on that. Um, As a business owner who markets, my business is exclusively online. I market exclusively online. I actually have 
uh, people who do the creative part and other people who do the technical part and then they have to work together to make sure it all fits together. Uh, I, I find it very rare to find somebody that can do all of it. Yeah, for sure. You'll see that sometimes in small businesses, they'll be posting for, um, you know, like a digital marketing rock star who's supposed to yes. make videos, uh, manage the advertising campaigns, publish everything on the website. And you're like, oh, no, no, <laughs> six to seven people, really. Yeah, that would be a unicorn if they found that person. <laughs> Maybe a Pegasus. We got to go a little more rare than just a unicorn. Put some wings on it. So. <laughs> I oh, I'm going to remember that one. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> so talking a little bit more about your company, one of the things that always intrigues me when I talk to somebody who has a flex policy like your company has and who has remote work like your company has, um, are what's the percentage of people in your company, what's the makeup of people in your company who are full-time employees, part-time employees, um, and or independent contractors? Um, so we don't have any part-time employees. Our core Canadian staff is all full-time. Um, and then we engage uh, some contract workers who are also currently employed with us full-time. Um, and they are in the States, uh, India, a variety of locations, uh, primarily working on like niche development programs, uh, projects that we don't have the expertise in-house for. So everybody is generally working full-time. Okay, and the independent contractor roles, do they tend to be long, long term on the average or tempor temporary? Um, it depends on the project. Um, like some projects might take two years, others could be two weeks. Um, I would say nobody's truly employed full time as an independent contractor because that's not really the best way to utilize contract labor in general. Um, if somebody's going to be full time permanent, they should become an employee. Um, but for us, it's project based. So uh, we've got a team that's working on a longer project um, for some of our uh, in-house technology. And I'm also working with some contractors on our website, and that's a much shorter engagement. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, do you find that you have to interact with employees versus independent contractors differently? Are there different, um, um, or uh, do you feel like they're pretty much all the same? Employee, independent contractor, pretty much all the same to manage and keep happy and? Uh, I, I would say yes and no. Um, there are certain management principles that are the same no matter what, right? Like being a decent person, communicating clearly, having uh, extremely clear expectations. Every single person that you work with, you should be able to provide that, right? Um, whether it's an employee and you're mapping out a project or you're working with a contractor to build out the, the project map, that, that's all the same. With an independent contractor, though, you really should be able to expect um, and get more independence. Um, and there shouldn't be as baked into your business processes, of course, right? As an employee, um, you're probably going to have a more collaborative experience, but a contractor should be able to, you know, run away with a piece of project and, and return their deliverables with a little less management. That's kind of the whole point of engaging contract labor, I think. Right. And thus the term independent, right? <laughs> That's how I look at it, at least. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely personality types that um, love independent contracting more than they do um, being an employee. Like there's some people who they go to independent contracting and they love that independence and freedom to structure their day and they never go back. Right. And then there's other folks where they try it and it's, it's just too stressful, right? Because they kind of have to be their own boss and hustle for work. And so they come back into the fold and become an employee again. So I've done both myself. Uh, I spent a few years when I was a freelance writer as an independent contractor. Um, and that was great for me for a long time. But right now, uh, being an employee is what fits better. So yeah, and isn't it awesome that there's the opportunity to do either one, depending on what works best for you at the time in your life that you have right now? Because that's really, I don't know what you think, but I really feel like there are different times in our lives when um, being an employee versus being an independent contractor might be better for you, or uh, doing flex work might be better, or doing remote work might be better, or being in an office might be better. What do you think about that, Megan? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's definitely times in your life where um, the working arrangement that you've been used to for a long time is just not going to work for you anymore. And you shouldn't be trapped in it, you know? Um, like say you've been working corporate for, for 20 years and you're just ready for something different or you're starting a family or just something is so significantly different in your life, you should be able to, and thank goodness we can now, try something different, be it remote work, contract work, part-time even. I think like part-time arrangements are so underestimated as well because there's so many folks who could really benefit from a few months of going part-time and they're still going to contribute to their company like uh, so, so much, but they just need to dial back a bit for a little while. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah. Instead of not working at all, dial back a bit and work part-time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I find that, um, especially when it comes to, you know, like personal challenges um, and even like mental health issues, sometimes taking a complete break is actually worse for you because you can be so isolated then. Whereas being able to work part time or even being engaged with your former employer on a contract basis, it lets you still get opportunities to, you know, network with your, the, the people that you're used to networking with and having a feeling of accomplishment that comes from work. Oh, yeah. So when we think about remote work, um, and of course, as you mentioned, with the pandemic, a lot of people had the opportunity mm -hmm. to try out remote work. Um, let's talk, we're going to talk in, uh, about two different um, reasons people and businesses might decide that remote work is good. So could you share a couple of business reasons you feel like remote, offering remote work to people in your company could be good? For sure. There's a whole bunch of really compelling business reasons. Um, the first one, obviously, is your bottom line, right? You, if you go to a fully remote team, um, you're no longer spending on infrastructure. You're no longer spending on, um, uh, you don't have to spend on commercial rent, right? Um, and you and every member of your team gets so much more flexibility, so much more time in their day to devote themselves to work, right? So when I was uh, working in the office, I would commute to downtown Toronto, and that would take me about 45 minutes each way. Um, and that was 45 minutes of essentially dead time because I'm on the subway, right? So I can't check emails, can't do anything else. If the subway breaks down, which it does a lot in Toronto because it's a stressed system, I might lose two, three hours of the day because, you know, I'm just stuck in the tunnel and that's that. Once you're a remote team, those things just kind of melt away. So you're saving a lot of time, you're saving a lot of money, um, and honestly, you're saving a lot of stress. You know, of course, people, many people love the camaraderie of being in an office and being able to just walk over to each other's desks. But at the same time, even the most social extroverted people do get stressed by unexpected interruptions. You know, so when you're at home, you have so much more control over that. Yeah, and I just did a webinar yesterday on, and shared statistics on how much time you lose when you multitask. And multitasking can be somebody interrupting you in your office. For sure. I'm not sure that I believe there's such a thing as multitasking because, you know, I agree. <laughs> so much time for you to, to move from one mm -hmm. track to another and you lose some, so much along the way. And every time you're interrupted in your office, you know, shave a few minutes of productivity off of your day, right? Because you have to kind of mm -hmm. reset your brain. Oh, yeah. What was I doing? Spreadsheet? What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that studies show that your brain truly cannot do two things at once. It switches between them. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, yeah, so you're right about that. And if you find yourself, you know, playing on your phone in a meeting because you think you can multitask, just know that you're lying to yourself. You've completely tuned out at this point. Yeah. Because I've done this too, so. <laughs> I know, me too. I was listening to somebody ask a really long question the other day on a Zoom call, and they were asking me the question, <laughs> and I checked email, <laughs> and I thought, oh, I just look real fast to see if this person replied to me. I mean, that's all I was doing. I wasn't even going to reply to the email, just checking to see if they replied, because I thought, this is going to go on forever, and of course, it ended, and I was like, what? <laughs> I remember being 
university student and the professors would get so angry if you um, were distracted in any way. And I thought that was so ridiculous when I was a student, you know, I'm like, it's fine. I'm taking great notes. I can play this game and also listen to this lecture. It's no big deal. He's wasting so much of my time. Now as a manager, I'm like, oh no, I was such a, Mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't realize that I was completely zoning out. Yeah. But Megan, I can tell you that you are a really good manager to know this because I get a lot of complaints from people who say that their manager at the the job they work at says, why are you just sitting there doing one thing? Can't you do this and this also? (laughs) So they don't know. I'm actually so, maybe I'm over-organized sometimes, but um, I ask all my team members, especially now that we're remote, to put in, um, put lunch hour into your day, put breaks into your day, like schedule it in the calendar, set reminders for yourself. This is a block for you to work on creative projects. This is a block for you to work on, you know, analyzing things. And that time has to be really sacrosanct, right? Because there's just no way that you're going to be able to create an advertising campaign while you're also trying to, you know, push updates to the website, connect with the contractor about, you know, some programming issue and so on and so on. Well, I'm ready to come work for you, Megan. I love your kind of management. You you are one smart lady, but I knew that already just from interviewing you before this. (laughs) So, um, it seemed like there was one more thing that um you you triggered oh i know what it was um so you were talking about blocking your time so do you like do you recommend time blocking on calendars as a way to manage your time yeah i mean it won't necessarily work for everyone um but uh it's kind of how i work um and i think if you analyze i don't know sort of keep track of what you of how you work over the course of the week I think you might find, or at least a lot of people will find that they have been time blocking and they don't know, right? And um, they also have like an ebb and flow throughout the day and throughout the week in terms of productivity, attention span, um, and just capacity to work on one kind of project versus another. And I think you should, you know, be kind to yourself um, and you should be honest with yourself. Like if, if you have just no capacity to do writing first thing in the morning, don't try to do writing first thing in the morning. You know, do your email, get your scheduling out of the way, check on reports, do that writing in the afternoon after you've had a break. Like you have to use your time sensibly. Don't force yourself. You know, you're not on a, you're not on a factory line here. Yeah. Thank goodness. I, I don't, I'm glad I have not had to work on a factory line. I would do it if I had to feed my family, but I would not do it just for fun. Oh, I've never worked on a factory line, but I had worked in retail for a long time. And in retail, they love time studies, you know, Um, and they they kind of work it out for the whole day, like exactly how you should spend your time and not to knock retail. But I think even there, you know, people have capacity for different things at different times of the day. Maybe they shouldn't just be on the cash all day. (laughs) Maybe you give them some time to work on something else as a break. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I did not realize that. I've never worked in retail either. Oh, really? I've lived a sheltered life, haven't I? (laughs) (laughs) Um, well thank you for sharing those business reasons you also believe that there are compelling social reasons to embrace remote work could you talk about those yeah for sure i feel like for a long time um many of us were writing about these these issues and they weren't getting a lot of uptake but um with the advent of the pandemic and so many people going to remote work i think suddenly they're getting a lot more attention so you may have noticed coming up in your own feeds suddenly there's a lot of uh, articles that are like hey i wanted to work remotely for for 10 years and i couldn't get it set up suddenly everyone is interested in accessibility and everyone's working remotely and suddenly companies are capable of offering these accommodations. So um, some of the issues that I've been writing about over the years and working on in uh, with my employers are um, to do with remote works capacity to aid in accessibility, diversity and inclusion, right? So when you're working from home, you suddenly have so much more control over your environment. So whether you have a disability, um, it could be visible or invisible, Um, That is like it could be a physical uh, disability, it could be a mental health issue. Once you're at home, you can control that environment. 
you know, like you might have a light sensitivity and you can now fix that instead of being sort of assaulted by uh, the office lights all day. Or um, say you're working in a wheelchair and your office has really struggled to get everything in place that they're required by law to get into place. But at home, you've got all your ramps, everything's wide enough, you know, suddenly you're capable of doing so much more. Um, and, and the same goes for diversity and inclusion as well, right? Uh, women particularly struggle in the workforce because when they start families, there's so little flexibility when they leave and when they return. With remote work, um, it gives them so many opportunities to, to customize the workday to what makes sense at each stage of growing that family, right? You know, some people would uh, want to come back from mat leave earlier than... Um, they might want to come back from mat leave earlier than they're able to if they could work part time or if they could work remotely. Other people want to stay home longer. You know, every single person is different, but with remote work, you can really customize it and um, figure out what works for you and works for your company. And it, it's weird to say the good thing about the pandemic, but one of the good things is <laughs> really that we are capable, right? And all of these organizations that were uh, so resistant to remote work and had these sort of rigid processes all of a sudden those have broken down and you've realized that it was so much easier than you thought it was. Yeah. I, I too have watched in awe as all these companies have said, no, I will, we will never re- allow remote work. We're not going to allow flex time. We're not going to allow any of this stuff. Now they're like, Oh yeah, we have to do it. <laughs> all of a sudden you realize it yeah. doesn't take that much. It's not that bad. And um, IT policy perspective to get it going, you know, and I hope um, as we return to the office, you know, because uh, stay at home orders are lifting in so many places, lots of people are going back to work. I hope that the companies and, and, you know, every manager remembers that this is a possibility, right? And they offer it to their workers in in the future. And um, nobody's looked down on it, uh, looked down on for it, right? You know, sometimes people are punished for, for asking for accommodations or for seeking some sort of different arrangement. And that shouldn't be the case. Mm-hmm. It should be embraced because, you know, these people are, um, these are folks who could perform so well for your company and they're not able to because there's some kind of a barrier that you've put into place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a colleague who is allergic to air conditioning. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. And she has severe reactions to air conditioning. Oh. But she is absolutely brilliant businesswoman. Yeah. And as a result, she she did have to she did choose to start her own business because that was the only way by working from home um, at her own business could she actually control that environment. Yeah, for sure. There's so many there's just so many cases like that. Um, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's list of things like you've got folks with chronic pain or chronic fatigue and maybe they just really need a nap and to be right it's not a huge accommodation but there just is no space at the office for it so by allowing them to work from home like they get exactly what they need and you get what you need which is a high performing happy employee right and i think it has like a positive effect for your your company culture as a whole you know, like it's not as though having people working different hours or from different spaces will, you know, dissolve your your sense of unity or something. Instead, like I think you are, have a much more flexible, resilient organization that's open to change um, and open to new ideas. Right. So I, I think it just it happens more naturally that way. You're you're less it's less likely that you're going to commission, you're going to put together an internal commission for a report to create a report to analyze your diversity statistics um, and, and then make an action plan and so on and so on. Instead, once you open yourself to different people working differently and approaching the work differently, you know, that starts to happen a little more naturally. Yeah, which brings up another question that I have for you. What advice would you give to the companies, and maybe it's not so much a company um, as a manager, or perhaps it is the company culture, who, and I've read this in several different articles since um, people had to work remotely for COVID, the managers are worried that the employee will not work. They will not get their work done because that manager is not there to watch over their shoulder to make sure they get into work on time, to make sure they're actually at their desk. So what advice would you give to those people? Well, the first thing I would say is don't install time tracking software. 
That's <laughs> Um, you already obviously have a trust problem in your team, um, where you don't trust your employees to, you know, handle themselves and perhaps they don't trust you either. Um, there's some sort of negativity there where perhaps they're underperforming, um, and that does need to be addressed, but tracking them is not going to help. It's just going to make them perform less, right? Um, and you're going to have a whole lot of data that you really can't do anything with. So sort of generating data for no reason. So the first thing that you should do is talk to them, right? Find out what's going on, what's causing this underperformance, uh, starting late. It could be an environmental issue, right? So I love remote work and I advise it uh, for everybody if, if that's what they love, but not everybody's home is set up for remote work. They might not have uh, a workspace set aside. They might have uh, roommates, family, pets, something like that. That's uh, just making it difficult for them to stay on track the whole, the whole day. And that's okay, you can work with that, right? Like you can find a way to um, ameliorate those difficulties, whether it's, you know, maybe it's a split day, maybe you send them some uh, technology, you send them a headset, you send them, um, a, you know, a computer stand, whatever it is about their environment that's causing that challenge. Um, and then just on a personal level, like it's obviously an incredibly stressful time right now for everybody. And I think you need to make some allowances for that. And, you know, you don't want to delve into people's personal issues too deeply. That's just not really appropriate as a manager. But just try to get out of um, what is causing um, this underperformance, what challenges are you experiencing, and what can I as a manager do to make that easier for you? I think that's something that a lot of people don't ask is how, do, how can I help you? I totally agree. Yeah, uh, the way I look at being a manager is I'm there to remove roadblocks for you so you can get your job done better and faster and easier. Yeah, for sure. Like this person is on your team for a reason, right? And and they're skilled and, and you should be able to trust them and they should be able to trust you. So um, if you're super worried that they're not going to get anything done, there's something really broken in the relationship. It's not anything mm -hmm. the work uh, with being remote or in office. There's something wrong with the relationship. Most of the people that I've spoken with, and you know, of course, I haven't done a scientific study on this or anything, but I'd like to hear your um, perspective on this. Most people that I've spoken with who really enjoy working remotely, they actually work uh, more productively mm -hmm. and they get more done when they get to work remotely. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's actually been a lot of studies on this um, that show that that's the case for the vast majority of workers. Um, the exception being that uh, many of us uh, find it challenging to do highly collaborative work remotely because there is something special to being in a room together and bouncing around ideas. Um, but uh, most of the surveys that they've done in the past and even during this COVID, you know, forced remote, uh, show that the vast majority of workers are performing uh, better than ever. They're more productive. They get more out of their day, not just because, you know, there's no commute anymore, but, you know, there's less distractions. So um, an eight-hour workday is a lot more like an eight-hour workday instead of a six-hour workday, which is what a lot of us manage to eke out uh, when we're in a busy office. Um, and for me personally, I think I do work better on most projects, remotely there's some things where i wish i could get together with my team and um what i think is most likely going to happen after um the pandemic passes whether that's this year or next year um is that there'll be days that we go into the office to work together and the rest of the time we'll quietly be working remotely so that's your prediction for the future for the majority of I, I was seriously I would love your prediction for the future for the majority of businesses do you think that they will go back to the way things used to be or will they embrace at least a part of remote working um I think that immediately as soon as it is possible many many companies will go back to the way that things were um but it may not stay that way in the long run right because you know there's a uh, many workers, many managers are clamoring back into the office because they missed the way it was. And then they're going to go back and it's going to be how it was for maybe a year. And then they're going to be like, man, I had so much more time when I got to have, you know, Friday at home and I could, you know, just right after work, go for a walk with my 
dog or, you know, and I think that people will start to miss remote work. Um, and I think the numbers will also be in favor of remote work as well. You know, um, I think a, a tremendous amount of business, sorry, a tremendous amount of businesses are losing a lot of money right now with, with empty offices. Um, and I think if you're, you know, in finance, you might take a look at that and think, hey, maybe I can, uh, you know, make a huge win for this company um, and save us a lot of money long term. If we have hot desks for, you know, a lot of our workforce, um, maybe we're only going to come here two times a week. Maybe we don't even have an office and we just engage a co-working space to do meetings. You know, um, I think smaller companies, startups, small businesses, uh are already making the choice to stay remote. You're starting to see that in the tech space particularly. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because tech workers uh, are further along that learning curve uh, just naturally, right? They work with technology every day. Um, if you're a creative in marketing, maybe not, right? It, you're just not used to you know, being so responsible for your own technology. Um, but this, this period of forced remote work has forced us all to learn these things that we haven't in the past, right? So I think it's going to be a mix. Some companies will stay remote. Some will go back um, because they're just so eager to have things return to normal. And then some of them will realize that, you know, they can do better than normal. I think um, that you have just come up with, if somebody hasn't already thought of this, you've just come up with a new business, which is um, traveling IT people who can go from house to house doing IT work. You know, like how UPS shows up and drops off your package? Well, this can be an IT guy that shows up and fixes your IT Yeah. if they need to do it in person. They can also do it. I mean, my uh, I have a computer maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. I live in Missouri in the USA. Um, my, I, my guy that keeps my computer running, he's in Canada. He's in British Columbia. And he, I've worked with him for four years. And he keeps my computer running remotely. Nice. I know that um, some large firms that have uh, really big call centers where people work uh, remotely now, what they'll mm -hmm. do is they'll ship out uh, a laptop headset, et cetera. And, you know, your first day of work is just you setting it up or some of them have the IT guy come and help you set it up. And then there you, you go. To go. Yeah. I would want an IT guy to come set my up. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> rather... <laughs> I get very mad on my phone when it doesn't read my mind. So I think maybe. <laughs> my computer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I will tell you that, you know, I seriously, I think that would be a great new uh, career for somebody who really enjoys doing that kind of stuff. So there yeah. you go. Anybody's looking for a new career. <laughs> so this idea. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet, but we definitely should talk about is, um, so one of the things that remote work opens up for you and your company is a different kind of talent pool, right? So if you're a larger company um, and you need, you recruit say 300 people every year, um, you're primarily recruiting people from your local area. When you have a remote team, you can recruit from all over the world, right? And that's, uh, that's great because you're getting, you know, geographic diversity, you're getting, um, you know, diversity of backgrounds, religions, and so forth in a way that you weren't before, right? And you can also open yourself up to different kinds of working arrangements too. Like you might have full-time uh, full employees, part-time employees, contractors. Once you go remote, the, your options are so much wider. And for the workers, it means that they have much wider options as well. They don't have to relocate anymore. So um, you may have noticed in the publishing and media industry, there's been all these uh, huge layoffs lately, and there's been a lot of uh, labor unrest and pushing for, um, you know, permanent remote work. So, and the reason for that is that uh, the media and publishing industry in the United States is largely concentrated in LA and New York, two incredibly expensive cities to work in. And there's a reason why those industries are, you know, the vast majority of people in those industries are upper middle class white people, right? Because their parents could afford to help them set up shop in a really incredibly expensive city and sponsor mm -hmm. them for the first 10 years of their career until they're making a living wage. But wow, if, I had never thought about that. You're now able to recruit wider and more people can afford to trial those careers. 
Yeah, I was, um, that is such a great point. I was reading something yesterday. I can't remember where it was that I was reading it, but they, somebody was predicting that there would be people moving out of Silicon Valley in California if they continue with remote working because they could afford to live, um, you know, higher living standard if they move somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you? Obviously, um, there's something to be said for being in, you know, a hot city where there's lots of restaurants and clubs and, you know, it's mm -hmm. exciting. But um, if you're a Facebook engineer making $200,000 a year and you have roommates, because that's the best you can do, like, that's right. Wild. Like, you could move to a much smaller town or even just a, an up-and-coming city, and that money will go so right. much farther. And it's not going to have an impact on your work. You know, you're still going to be networking with your employees, learning and so forth, but you're going to be able to do so much more with your money and have a much better lifestyle. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for bringing up that topic. Is there anything else that I haven't thought to ask you that you want to be sure to share with our listeners? Oh, man, no, nothing comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you all day, Megan. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's many other topics in remote work that I should be bringing up, but it's <laughs> under it now. Oh, this is really interesting. And I love all the different points that you bring forward about it, all the different benefits. And I know we just really hit on some of the top ones. There are a lot of benefits to remote working. And um, I also like that you use a hybrid model in your company because I think that works for a lot of Will, will really work for a lot of companies with your mix of people that work in the office, people that work remotely, and people that have, have the flex policy. Yeah, I think the hybrid model is um, it definitely works for us, but I think it uh, is what's going to work best for many companies that are used to working in office. You know, it's a huge shift to go from in office to remote first, um, and a hybrid model you know, it kind of serves everyone, introverts, extroverts, um, people with families, young singles, everyone gets a little bit of what they want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know one more thing that I wanted to bring up um, since we've been talking about the pandemic forced remote work is while I hope that the companies look at this and go, oh, look what is possible. I hope they also, and especially the people who are remote working, also take into consideration that not only were they suddenly thrust into this without the ability to really plan it out well, but many also had their children and entire families forced to be at home with them. And so they had a lot more stress and mm -hmm. multiple things they had to deal with all at once in addition to working remotely. What do you think about that? Yeah, for sure. I think um, every team leader right now and uh, executives should definitely be looking at how well their team performed under tremendous stress and trying to be really kind to their to all of their employees. You know, if somebody's at home with three kids, they're teaching and parenting and working all at the same time because kids don't stop uh, just because you're in a <laughs> right. Like kids are still doing stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I just talked to somebody yesterday. I'm yeah. sorry. I just talked to somebody yesterday and I said, uh, so how are you liking working remotely for the first time? And she's like, I really couldn't tell you because I've got three kids and a husband who's now here and it's overwhelming. And that made me, that made my heart hurt for her. And I said, well, hopefully you'll get a chance to try it with not all that other on top of it. Yeah. I think that's, um, you know, in Ontario, um, more and more of our daycare options are opening. We had first, uh, at first it was only very small daycares and now some of the medium sized ones are opening up. Um, and I think as that happens and uh, the parents stay home, but the kids go to daycare, they're going to finally get that opportunity to experience <laughs> like all along. And, you know, they've had their coworkers that are like, I love this remote work. Let's never stop. And they're just like, oh, <laughs> I can't take it anymore. But now they get the chance. Yeah, and so that made me think of one more thing that I want to mention, and this is a big complaint I had when I worked in a corporation and, you know, actually worked in the office, and I no longer have this working remotely for myself, 
but I've never worked remotely as an employee. I've never worked remotely for someone else. So I'm not sure how this works out. So what I love is the absence of office politics, the office drama. (laughs) (laughs) I think office drama will always be there. Um, (laughs) It's just drama between people, right? But I think that a number of, um, you know, sort of the shittiest microaggressions that you face in the day kind of uh, are harder to perform remotely. You know, um, I'm sure as a woman, you've had experiences where, you know, guys will use their body language to try to, you know, dominate meetings or, you know, intimidate you. Uh, It's a little harder to do that particular thing on a, a voice only call. Um, there's mm-hmm. other things that can be done, but that fades away. Um, and there's obviously gossip opportunities because you've got uh, direct messages in addition to main chats. But a little bit of that fades away too, I think. You know, like there's no facial expressions. Um, you can't, you know, look at somebody else in the meeting, like roll your eyes at them. Oh, can you believe it? <laughs> harder to do? So I would say the office politics is still there, but in some ways it's easier to manage. But um, I think we all still have to be diligent to not, you know, not be shitty to each other. That's always <laughs> I know it's just so. Well, and you're absolutely right. I don't think it would, will go away totally. But for, for somebody like me, for example, um, when I'm not around some people every day, all day long, year in and year out, um, I can definitely be kinder because they're not uh, on my nerves every day in that building and that building because, you know, I might see them just via Zoom or hear them on the phone, but I don't have to be around them all the time. So yeah, for sure. I felt I felt like that was really a benefit for me. Yeah, that's so true. And I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of unconscious biases that people are carrying, be it, you know, gender, sexuality, age, um, race. And um, it's not to say that that disappears in a remote environment. It doesn't, you know, you still have to work on those issues and um, that's never going to just fade away. Like you have to actively work on it. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you don't see everybody's face, you may not be dismissing Kathy because she's older (laughs) you know you're Mm -hmm. just Kathy's incredible words and seeing her work instead Mm -hmm. yeah I will tell you as a virtual assistant um, I have never experienced ageism wow as an employee after 45 I'm 63 now and I still do not experience ageism uh, working uh, as a virtual assistant but at the age of 45 in person because I look my age. I, ever, I experience a lot of ageism. Yeah. I can tell you one thing. I definitely don't miss uh, people commenting on my uh, outfits or, you know, unwelcome intrusions and in those kinds of topics. Nobody sees how mm-hmm. I'm dressed, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you on that. Well, and, you know, I, I hope things are better in the offices these days. I've been gone for so long now. I, the last time I worked in an office was 1998, and I still had bosses who would say, come in, turn around, let me see what you got on today. Oh, my God. That was very uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've really not had that. I feel like maybe when I first started working, but uh, not in the last few roles for sure. Um, And I feel like I'm pretty blessed at uh, the current environment. We've actually got a huge distribution of generations in the workplace. You know, we've got uh, from seniors to like new grads um, and everybody just has to work together. It's a fairly small team. And I think that helps a lot. You know, we're from all over the world, all different ages, completely different perspectives and totally different hobbies too, which is another great thing because you can introduce each other to different types of stuff. Um, And it just works. So I feel pretty blessed in that respect. Oh my gosh, that sounds so wonderful. So (laughs) Megan, if anybody wants to learn more about you and the companies you work for, how can they do that? Best place to find me these days is probably on LinkedIn. So you can uh, connect with me there. Um, And uh, you can, of course, find me on uh, the CPS blog, writing lots of content about why everybody should be going remote. 
um, and uh, <laughs> Team Chronos Sites, and uh, our new project, which is a remote first job board called Work the North. So you can connect me through connect with me through there as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this very insightful interview. I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk with me. Thanks so much for having me, Kathy. It was a great conversation. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There, you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.